Good morning, First Christian Church community. We are so glad you are joining us here today uh, for online church again. Um, again, we, we do wish we could be meeting, um, but in these unusual times that we are living in right now, um, we're still uh, being cautious, uh, cautiously optimistic and hoping that we can meet together soon. It is Sunday, April 19th, and we it's a week after Easter, and we are glad that you joined us for Easter. We are glad that we could celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. But today, I want to start a new series. Um, it's called Extraordinary God, Unusual Circumstances. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at uh, the stories of Scripture um, and to see those unusual circumstances where, where God was extraordinary and where God did mighty things and how, how that applies to what we're dealing with in our present day uh, of time that we're living, the present culture that we're living in. And you know, right now we're living in a very unusual circumstances. We're living in a very unusual times and a virus that we know very little about. It seems like something new comes out week by week. Um, you know, how to, how to combat it or, or how to stay away from it. Um, we have these stay at home orders. Some, some states are enacting these crazy stay at home orders or these essential versus non essential things. And uh, one cart, one shopper. You know, we see businesses closed. Uh, we see businesses on the brink of financial collapse. We see uh, people, homes, families sometimes on the brink of financial collapse. And, you know, we, we, we also see in, in what we determine the national media is we see a government um, kind of that never gets along. You know, we see a world threatened by all of this and, and we're sitting here going, what is going on? And so we, we wonder how unusual it is, these circumstances that we're living in. They're unusual for sure. But through all of this, we know that God is extraordinary. And through it, God still remains in complete control of this whole situation that we are in. Sometimes we think, what is God up to? I wish I had a glimpse behind the, the veiled curtain sometimes that, that God would allow us to see a part of the plan um, that he's working on in our lives, in our community, in our church, um, in the world. Uh, sometimes we wish we had a glimpse of that plan that he's working on right now and the extraordinary things that he's going to do. And But one thing I do know um, is for sure is that God always has a plan from Scripture. God always knows what is going to happen. God always is in control of it all. And throughout Scripture, we find these stories that seem unusual to, to say the least. Uh, some of these stories might receive an R rating if it were a movie. Um, others blow our, our notion of, of family values, blow our minds of what, what family values are. They blow them out of the water. Um, think about this, like when Moses' wife uh, ran and circumcised their son really quickly and threw it at Moses. And, you know, he threw the foreskin at Moses and we think, what is that for? And other things, you know, when, when a prophet calls some bears out of the woods to, to beat up on some teenagers, to maul some teenagers uh, because they were getting a little out of hand with, with God's prophet. You know, what, what's the plan behind that, we wonder sometimes, you know. We're, try telling that to, if you're in high school ministry, try telling that to a bunch of rowdy teenagers at some point. You know, other times we, we see things like a woman who, who would dress as a prostitute and she tricks her father-in-law into getting her pregnant and their son ends up actually being in the genealogy of Jesus. Pretty wild stuff, huh? And these are very unusual circumstances in scripture and they're not usually presented on the, the flannel boards for VBS or Sunday schools. You know, sometimes we hardly even talk about them at all. We, we kind of gloss over them in scripture and think, oh, maybe we can hide that part of God. But God put them there in the Bible for a reason. And, and to help us understand a little bit more about our current circumstances, we would be well advised to find what God is up to then and what he's up to now. You know, but I, I, I want you to understand something. This, is, this, is, this series is going to be somewhat wild and somewhat unpredictable for us. 
And through some of the, it's going to be, I'm going to be talking about some of the weirdest stories in the Bible, the unusual circumstances that, that went on, the weird things that went on. But we see God in his extraordinary uh, capabilities, extraordinary powers, extraordinary presence through all of this. And, I, and through all of this, I hope to show you, even in these unusual circumstances, they reveal important things about the character and the nature of God and what they mean for us today. And so as we, as we are, are going into this with an open mind and an open heart, I, I want you to begin to pray with me. Um, but before we pray, I, I do want to remind you that, uh, as always, we're going to be taking communion at the end of this. And I would ask that you would have your supplies ready, your grape juice and your bread of any kind, um, works. And so we will be rem remembering what the Lord Jesus Christ did on that day for us so long ago. So won't you pray with me and we'll get into the meat of this. Dear, dear Jesus, we come to thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity to be together as a church. Albeit unusual how we're meeting through uh, online content. Lord, I pray that you would help us to continue to strive to to dig deeper into your word, to strive to, to preach the word more effectively in our communities, in our homes. Lord, people that we talk to, Lord, how, how we might offer the hope and love that you, you give. So Lord, we ask that you would be with us now and help us in this time. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' precious holy name that I pray. Amen. So today we're going to be looking at that unusual circumstance in which God, uh, God's people were asked to do something um, very unusual. And, and sometimes we, the story, we would read it and we're, we're sitting here thinking, this seems really far out of character of who God is. But remember, our God is not a false God. God is sovereign. That means he's supreme ruler over everything, over the universe, over the space, over, over time, over, over everything. God is sovereign over all of that. And God asks his people to march on a city and destroy everything in it. That is living. Everything. Man, woman, child, beast. Everything is to be destroyed. In the midst of all of this, though, when they're asked to do this, God does something extraordinary to, to show that he is sovereign over all. Even nature itself. Man-made nature things he is sovereign over those as well and so you know the part of the bible that we're going to be in is in joshua chapter 5 verses 13 through all the way through chapter 6 now i'm not going to read it to you today i'll be reading parts of it but not all of it and so i want you to get have your bibles and turn there it's joshua chapter 5 verse 13 through all the way through chapter 6 now, Joshua is the sixth book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, right in there, right after the book of Deuteronomy, okay? It's the sixth book of the Bible. And so, um, here, here's, here's what we need to have, though. We need to have a little bit of backstory. As you're turning there, I want you to listen. So, God promises an old man, Abraham, a child. The old man and his old wife, Sarah, have a baby, and it's a miracle, Abraham's 100 years old. Sarah is 90 years old. Now, now you can imagine, you ladies out there, imagine having a baby at 90 years old. Uh, I kid with Denise a lot about that, and she she doesn't think it's funny. So, um, imagine being that that old in that part of the Bible in that kind of savage time that they lived, and so they were going to have their first child at 190 years old. Now that's a miracle in itself, okay? But the baby isn't the only thing promised to Abraham on that day. You see, Abraham was also promised a place to live, a place where his children and his children's children and his children's children's children would live forever. The old man, Abraham, is promised that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Now think about that for a moment. You know, if it was just Abraham and his family, it'd be really easy for God to say, okay, here's a couple of acres for you. But we're talking hundreds of thousands of millions of millions of people 
that need a place to live. And so some things happened in between God's promise to Abraham to have a child and the land that they were going to live, the promised land, we call it. And some things happened. God's people wandered from the truth of who God was. They began to do evil things. They began to commit sin. And so because of it, as a result, they spent 400 years in slavery to the Egyptians. Now, Moses comes along, and there was what, what some would estimate about 2 million people, Israelites, that are going to need a lot of space to live. Now, 2 million people doesn't seem like a lot uh, when, we, when we talk about what, how many people are in the world today. But 2 million people on a couple acre plot that might have been promised to Abraham would be a lot of people. Okay, So they're going to need a lot of space to live. And so that space is called the promised land. Now, they've never lived in the promised land, so what, what had happened is this empty land flowing with milk and honey, you can imagine. It's a beautiful landscape. It's beautiful country. It's not just going to sit vacant for 400 years. People are going to come. People are going to live there. And it's the land that, that God showed Abraham. He says, I'm going to give you that land flowing with milk and honey. And it was a promised land for him, but they have never lived there. And so people came in and occupied the land. But what happens is when they come out of, of Egypt, they wander in the desert for 40 years and some things that happen. We'll talk about that in a moment. But when they come out of it and they're standing at the edge, God says, I want you to take it, but you're going to have to take it by force. You see, this is where we as people go, what, what did you just say, God? You want us to do what? You want us to go in there and conquer the land? You want us to go to war with the land? And so we, we try to process in our, in our minds, our human minds, and, and we begin to think this is very unusual, and the Israelites are asked to do a very hard thing, and it's to kill people. And so, and God is asking them to kill everything, not just the people, everything. And this is problematic for us because of our human nature. And our human nature says, well, you can't do that. And so here's a few things that we need to note, okay? That we need to make sure that we're clear on uh, as we go into this, okay? There's no such thing as a holy war. Holy war, holy war. A holy war, okay? So war is never holy, okay? War is very violent. It is never holy. Violence is never holy, okay? And, and violence is a result of sin entering the world. And it's, it, it's one of the very first sins committed outside the Garden of Eden. Think about it. Cain killed Abel. That's the very first, one of the very first sin that was committed outside of the Garden of Eden. God's perfect utopia for humankind. And when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, the, one of the very first sins that was committed was Cain killing Abel, a violent act. So violence was in our hearts from the beginning as sinful humans, okay? Now, however, we do have to understand that violence is sometimes necessary in a sinful world because of the hardness of people's hearts, okay? And war, just like other things that we read about in Scripture, like polygamy, like slavery, like divorce, okay? It exists in the Bible because it existed in the, in the world due to the sin of the human race. God didn't put it here. God didn't say it's okay for you to do these things, but it was a result of the sin that was in the human heart, okay? And God has always come to us just as we are. You see, that's God's starting point, is he comes to where we're at. He doesn't, he doesn't make us come out of the mud first. He, he comes into the mud with us. And he, and he starts, begins to teach us, and he transforms us. He begins to transform us into what he originally designed us to be, okay? And that doesn't happen overnight. That, that's not a process that we think about and go, oh, I can change that habit overnight. It's not. It always takes time to teach someone a better way, especially God's ways, because our hearts are so hard, because our hearts are so sinful, Okay, and it's not a simple thing because we're dealing, we're talking about all of humanity and God must deal with sin. He must deal with evil and he must deal with injustice in the world. It cannot stand because it is not a part of God's way. And, and the plan has always been for us to be reconciled to him through, through somehow. 
And God works through us. God wants us to be a part of his plans. He, he wants us to be in the midst of those things. But we have to obey in, those, in, the, in the process. God doesn't need us to fulfill his plans. But that's the beauty in this whole thing is that God wants to include us. And it's important for us to obey in his way. And I, can I tell you that I, I am very thankful that we don't live during this time that Joshua and the Israelites had to march around there. I'm thankful that the plan to bring about Jesus Christ is done. And the obedience that God requires of, of us uh, seems to be far easier than what the Israelites had to do. We are asked to simply love God and love people. Now, the... It sounds easy, but, but it encompasses a whole lot of our life, whole, a whole lot of areas of our life, okay? For example, think about a few of these things. We work hard to avoid sin. Now, now if you think about that for a moment in your minds, it is very hard to avoid sin. It is very difficult for you and I to, to not, you know, to not, tell a little white lie for us to get ahead. It's, it's very hard for us not to, to cheat on our diets. It's very hard for us not to be gluttons. It's very hard for us not to be selfish. It's very hard for us to go on and on and on. Think about it for yourself. But we are to work hard to avoid sin. We are to live and to communicate Jesus. We live uh, as an example of who Jesus is and what his word was, what his word says. But we're not only supposed to live it, we're supposed to communicate it with our mouths. Telling people about Jesus, telling about his love, telling about his resurrection, telling about his hope that he offers us. We are to preach the word wherever we go, in whatever circumstance we are in. You see, when, when God scattered the church in the book of Acts... When God allowed the church to be persecuted, they, they got a little too comfortable with where they were at, uh, with what they were doing. They thought they were, they were succeeding on their own merit. And God said, I need you to go to the ends of the earth. You know, you're going to preach the word in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And they had only started with Jerusalem. They were only hanging out in Jerusalem. And God said, I need my plan to go. I need my people to go. And so God allowed the church to be persecuted and scattered throughout the land. And at the time, people were wondering, what is going on? Why is all this stuff happening? Why are we being attacked? Why are we being persecuted? You know, and we wonder those same things. Why is this virus raging? Why won't it stop? Why does, why didn't God do something? A lot, much like they were, they're thinking in the first century as well. But that doesn't stop them. They were to preach the word wherever we go. And you and I are to preach the word wherever we go, whatever circumstance it might be. You and I are to be diligent in our pursuit of obeying the scriptures. You know, uh, I shared with you maybe a month ago about, about keeping your oil ready when, when Jesus is going to come back. Our wicks trim so we know that our, our light is burning, that, that he can see us when we come back, that our hearts are pure. And another thing that we can do is we love, we don't manipulate people in order to tell them about Jesus. We don't make scripture so oppressive that, that we, we scare people into believing about Jesus or that we, we manipulated them in, into believing about Jesus and doing something that we've wanted them to do. But we love them through, no matter what, where they're at. Remember, God come to, comes to us where we are at, in the midst of our mess. And he's, he's asking us to do the same, to go to their mess and bring them out to tell them about Jesus. So back to the back to the story. Joshua and the Israelites were asked to follow God. What, what God says. Obey God and, and let him do the rest. You know, to, to obey what God was asking is unusual for sure, okay? We'll, we'll get to it in a moment. So here's the circumstances, that, that the unusual circumstances that surrounded the Israelites. The promised land is filled with giants. The city they come to is Jericho, a mighty city with walls that are very high. It's a fortified city. It's like the gates to the promised land. It's going to be something that protects the promised land. Israel has been wandering in the desert for 40 years. They're pretty tired, okay? God is asking them to fight, but not really fight, to march. 
And I want you to see this in verses two and five of verse, two through five of verse six. Let, let, let me read it to you this morning. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all your armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horns in front of the ark on the seventh day. March around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all your people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up every man straight in. Now, if we think about that in human terms, okay, you want us to march for a week. Okay, God. And then on the, the final day of the week, we have the priest go in front playing music the whole time. And we do it seven times. And then on the seventh blast, we shout really loud. And the walls are supposed to fall down. This, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. You're, you're asking us to conquer the promised land, but you're asking us to do it in a very odd way. We're supposed, I thought we were supposed to fight, God. I thought we are supposed to fight for what, what you want us to have. I thought you want us to cleanse the land. And here you have us doing something so ridiculous. And so this is their circumstance that they're in. They're, they're, they're asking to be done something. And, and when the walls fall, this is the last thing. When the walls fall, they're supposed to not leave anything alive. First of all, I'm, I'm standing before a giant city thinking... How in the world am I supposed to do this? You see, we look at this, I, I, I look at this much like what we're dealing with today in our daily lives. Our unusual circumstances that stand before us. We're looking at global shortages on goods. We're looking at death tolls. We're looking at looming tensions among our nation. We're looking at stay-at-home orders. We're seeing some states enforce crazy things between essential and non-essential. We're seeing the loss of jobs, and the list is going on and on and on, and we wonder, wait a second, what is going on? You, you want us to trust you in the middle of all of this, God? This is what our human heart is thinking. This is what our human sinful heart is thinking. And, and we're not to be thinking like this. You see, here's what we believe. God is the God of the universe. God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present. God is a God of order, not chaos. He loves us and works for the good of those who love Him. Okay? And we are to preach the word wherever we go, whatever the circumstance. You see, we most assuredly are in some very unusual circumstances as of late. But just like the Israelites, we're asked to trust and obey God. We're asked to trust and obey the plan He has for us. And I'm sure that the plan for Joshua and the Israelites was very absurd to him at the time. But you know what they did? They trusted God. They obeyed God in the midst of what they were asked to do. And, and you and I, we know what we're supposed to do. You and I are to preach the word wherever, whenever we go. Okay? We're to love God and to love others no matter the circumstances. Okay? We're, we're to give thanks. We're to uh, be joyful always. We're to, to pray continually because this is our will in Christ Jesus. We know what we're supposed to do, but are we doing it? That's the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we doing it? Are we trusting God? Are we trusting the process? Are we trusting the, the refining that we're going through? Are you using your time wisely here that you have? Are you using it to, to strengthen your family in, in the Word? Are you using it to strengthen your relationship with your spouses? Are you using it to strengthen your, your time with your children? Are you using it to strengthen your, your time with the Lord? Are you using your time wisely? That's what I, I wonder about for a lot of you. That's what I wonder about me. Am I using my time wisely? And so... We got to trust God in the middle of all this. We got to obey what he already commands us to do in the middle of all of, all of this. So, but I want to get back to the story now. I want to finish it up for you, okay? We have to consider how God must deal with sin, evil, and injustice, okay? 
This is something that, that we, we wonder about. It's hard to imagine, but the evil that was present among the Canaanites was so bad. It was this, as if the entire society had gone past the point of no return. You see, God has given them plenty of time to mend their evil ways, but they've just gotten worse. They practice human sacrifices. They practice prostitution as a form of worship. And, and you might think, well, that's not a big deal, really. But think about it for a moment. Imagine finding your, your wife was pregnant. She delivers your first son. And then you're asked by the priests to take that child and offer it as a burnt sacrifice. Lay him on the altar while he's still alive and wiggling and he's burnt up right before your eyes. Imagine that kind of sin and that kind of evil was going on. Or suppose you have a girl and you know one day she is marked by the priests to call her into service to be a prostitute to worship. And the idea that, that you have to continue to worship that way and that you might someday have to worship with your very own daughter. How disgusting and depraved and evil that would be. This is what these people were doing. Now what? Now think about what that does to a culture. Multiply it one child after another, generation after generation after generation, all in the name of their God, the false God Baal. Now God... He can no longer tolerate the sin. He can no longer tolerate evil and injustice happening to generations of humanity. And God says it has to stop. This is what is happening in the promised land of God to, the, to his people. This form of idolatry, this form of debauchery, this form of sin and wickedness is happening, happening in that land. This is the mess and the effect sin has on us. This mess is the reason that Jesus came to heal us from the grip of that sin. Sin no longer has a hold because of Christ. However, we are the ones who cause ourselves to sin. We allow ourselves to be enticed, drawn away, and sin. Therefore, we wander away from Christ. And we find ourselves in that kind of wickedness and debauchery and darkness. You see, the good news, though, however, is that Jesus paid for that, too. You see, that was the plan all along. In the midst of this messy humanity, there rose Jesus Christ to take all the sin upon him at the cross, to kill the sin and raise to a new life in order that we might have a way to God. But we have to know Christ. We have to follow Christ. We have to obey his word. We have to repent and believe. You see, we have to live for Jesus in order for being accounted amongst the ones that call ourselves Christians. This is why now, more than ever, in the midst of our circumstances, when people are afraid and unsure of what tomorrow might bring, we as believers, we shine our lights in order to tell people about the hope in Jesus. The hope that you have in Jesus, the hope that I have in Jesus. We are to rise up in this time and to let those lights shine. In the midst of this unusual circumstance that we're in, God is doing extraordinary things. We still have an extraordinary God. So here's the point of all of this is what I want you guys to, to take home with you. In today's world that we live in, it often feels that though it, it, the plan isn't quite working out the way it should right? You think about what's going on. There seems to be this giant fortified city in front of us and God is asking us to march. However, the only way forward is to hold on to God's amazing promises in one hand and the reality of disaster in the other. But you see, that's the problem is, is that we're holding on to both of them. We want a world that we can explain in a neat and tidy way. But that explanation never comes. We want the universe to be this machine and, and God to be this uh, mechanic that fixes it when it's broken. You know, I just watched Wreck-It Ralph the other night with my kids. We want, we want God to have a magic hammer like Felix 
where he can fix it. And, and, and all the while, we don't have to listen to God. But we want God to fix this brokenness. That's not who God is. You see, God remains sovereign through all this brokenness that the world is. And, and he promises eternity with him. We simply have to trust and obey the plan. He never says that he'll, he'll remove all the problems in our lives. He never says that he's going he's gonna to take and fix the brokenness of this world. He says, he's, I'm going to send you hope and a rescuer. And he already did that with Jesus. See, we're fortunate because we live in the age after Christ. We live in the age where we have the opportunity to tell people about Jesus because he's been here. And he's, and he's left witnesses and, and, and stories and scriptures throughout history. And followers have obeyed and brought us to today. You see, we have to work at what we've been asked to do. God extraordinarily conquered Jericho in the midst of Israel's unusual circumstances. He made mighty walls fall that day. And in the midst of our unusual circumstances, God is still sovereign over all. And I got a question for you. Do you trust and obey him through this process? Won't you pray with me? God, I just come to you to thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the extraordinary um, time that we, we have to be in, Lord, that you're working in and behind the scenes. Lord, that you're, you're working in our hearts, that you're working in our lives day in and day out, that you're breaking off the hardness and you're transforming us into the messenger that you want us to be. Lord, help us in this unusual circumstance that we're in. Help us in our time of need, Lord. Heal our land. Bring it back to what we don't fear. Bring it back to, to what we can live and breathe and move and, and hug and, and shake hands. and Bring it back to that, Lord. But Lord, may we never be the same from this. Your followers never be the same from this. May we be transformed because of this. May we know what it is to be messengers. Lord, thank you for showing up in Joshua's day. Even though you asked them to do a pretty unusual thing at an unusual time. Lord, help us in the midst of this unusual circumstances that we're in. May we see how extraordinary you are. And may you show up in a mighty way. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name that I do pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. Um, at this time, we are going to take communion as a body of believers together. And I want to remind you that Jesus Christ gave of himself. He gave his body. The Bible tells us that he made his dwelling among us. The word became flesh and made, made his dwelling among us. He put on flesh to be like us, to know what it is to be us, to know what it is to suffer, to know what it is to be tempted, to know what it is to be human. You see, Jesus Christ came as a body. And, and our, our bread cube, or your piece of bread at home, represents his body. It is the body that he, he sacrificed on the cross of Calvary that, that took the weight of sin for the whole world now and forever. It went upon himself broken for us. And this is what we remember. Christ's body broken for you. Christ's body broken for me. And as we take communion this morning, I want you to remember Christ and the sacrifice that he made for you. In scripture, we find that, that God required blood as a sacrifice for sin. And that's something that, that we don't neglect or we don't take lightly. It's not something that we say, oh, uh, it's okay to kill this or it's okay to kill that. It's not. You see, God takes it very seriously. And that's why it was very serious that it was a spotless lamb that would be sacrificed. A perfect lamb that was sacrificed for people's sin. And Jesus was that perfect lamb. He sacrificed with his blood for you and I on that cross of Calvary. But the, but the hopeful thing for us is he did not stay dead. Christ rose from the dead. 
And that's a great message that we all have. And to this day, we remember Christ and the blood that he shed for our sin to set us free from death that has no hold on us. Amen. As always, First Christian Church community, have a great week. I love you. I miss you. I wish we could be together. Um, hopefully soon, but we don't know yet. Uh, stay tuned uh, for another episode uh, coming next Sunday. Have a great week and we love you.